lecture number 10, serial buses. So today we're going to leave all these bu other bus systems behind us, the parallel buses, the memory bus systems, the AHB, APB, and we're going to talk about serial buses and how we use them in our embedded systems. A couple of announcements. Homework number two is due next Tuesday. Homework number 1.4, if you haven't submitted it yet, try to get it done this week so we can move on uh, with our um, homeworks. I also plan to post a midterm um, example sometimes this weekend. When I get to it, it probably will be last year's uh, midterm if you have already, if you already have it good, and if not, you will have it available. The midterm itself will be on February 28th during the class. Um, it will cover everything up to and including ADCs and DAX, which we will cover next week. Projects. A couple of people asked, so when do we have to select the projects? Well, there will be more details in lecture on February 26th. So that's the lecture before um, the lecture at the midterm exam. The project proposals will be due on March 5th. So you have a good week there to um, figure out what you really want to do. But start thinking now. So the goal is that you build an embedded system. So I gave a couple exa examples before. So start thinking of what you want to do and what you want to build. And if you have questions, send me emails and ask me if this is like feasible, if this is a good idea or not. So I can already tell you now what you would have to change or what you have to look for. We will then, after the project proposal are due on March 5th, we will then have a discussion March 6th and 7th, where I will schedule um, a little meeting with every group, like for like 15 to 30 minutes, talking about your proposal seeing what you have to change so you can either resubmit the proposal to me and I can look at it again or if it's good then you can start with your project. Any questions to this? Yes. Yes. Up to four. But the more people you are, the harder, more difficult your project has to be, of course. So there's advantages with having a big group because you, your project can be a lot more difficult. But at the same time, it also has to be a lot more difficult. There has to be enough work for everybody um, to do it. I will hand out a um, guide on how I will grade your project. It will basically entail different kind of parts that have to be in your project. So for example, it has to have one external device at least so that you have to write a driver for it. For example, an LCD display or a sensor and stuff like that. Um, so it's all in this big booklet and I will hand that out soon. Any other questions? Do you have a base of any I still need to do that too. Yes, it will probably come this weekend. All right, minute quiz. <coughs> so this point is from Wisconsin, so it's either cheese we have to minute quiz, is that okay? <laughs> and it's heavy. No minute quiz. Oh. <laughs> This would have been the minute quiz. Name one criterion by which you choose a memory technology for your embedded system. Hmm? Speed, cost, size, what else? What? Shipping time? Yeah, yeah, sometimes availability. Sometimes the market decides what's available and what's not available. What else? Heat temperatures, tolerances, absolutely. Anything else? Power. Coolness factor. Not sure about that one. Yeah. Yeah, interfacing, interface problems. Yes, volatility, non-volatile or volatile memory, right? One of the key things that you have to think about. Yeah. Yeah, what the usage is. Like if you have flash RAM, you can't use it for everything. Better not use it for any kind of swap files or else your um, flash will be destroyed in no time. Okay, we have to see this picture now a couple of times, right? We have talked about bosses in here, AHP, APB, and you have started using them in your labs, writing your memory mapped IOs, and you hopefully are now very familiar with the different signals and how you have to put them together with the P select and P enable and the clocks and how to push data in and out from these buses. Last time we talked about this bus over here, again, the memory interface. It's a high-speed parallel interface, so you can interface with parallel memories. 
Today, we're going to cover these buses here. These are very typical buses that you find on your embedded systems, namely a UART, USART, we have a TWI, a two-wire interface, we have SPI, and up here we have USB interfaces. These are all serial interfaces. So what's one advantage of a serial interface compared to this interface that you see over here? Less Small, less wires, right? You can look at some of these interfaces, for example, 2WI has two interfaces. Well, it's called a two-wire interface, right? Now, how many devices do you think can you connect to, for example, this particular bus? Two wires? 126, 127 devices. Just with two wires. Really cool, right? SPI it has here one, two, three, four wires. How many devices do you think can you interface with that one? <coughs> as many as you have GPIO pins is actually the right answer. The problem is SPI, and we will see that in a second, has a chip selector. So if you look on here, one of these lines is uh, actually four lines, so that's a chip select, to select one particular chip. So you can, as many chip select lines that you have, as many different peripherals can you hook up to this, in this case, three wire interface itself. Okay, so today we're going to cover UART, SPI, I2C, and a little bit of USB. Unfortunately, we won't go into details, details of USB because it's a fairly complex system, but at least we will give you a little overview of what USB is all about. So first, UART. UART stands for the Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Key here is asynchronous. What does that mean? No clock, we have to have a handshake. Okay, so get together in teams of two and think about a handshake that you could do. You have two systems, one here, one here. They don't share a clock. There's no clock signal that goes back and forth. You have one wire that goes from one system to the other, and the other one goes from this system to that system. What kind of ideas could you have to tell somebody that now data is coming over? All your wires are, you can have them high or low. Don't say it yet. Okay, so I saw you had a really good movement there. What, what was your idea? Take the other one by the hand and shake it. Perfect. How do you do that? Pretty much like you have the master, he raises the line to say, hey, I've got something to send. Okay. And the slave would say, hey, I'm ready to receive it. And then the master sends it, and then when the slave receives it, he drops his line. Okay. So you would have one line that's actually a control line from slave to master and there's no data going over that one or not. Okay, that could work. That's what else? Any other ideas? No? So let me show you what UART is doing because UART has a certain handshake exam. And in order to do a handshake, and he kind of hinted to it, right, the master raises a line. So what implies is that the line is by default low. Right? In UART, it's exactly the inverse. If you probe a UART line, by default, the line is high. And then the indication of a start of sending a byte from one end to the other is when the line gets pulled low for one bit. That's what's called a start bit, always logic zero. So by default, the UART line is high. As soon as it gets pulled low, the first bit has to be a zero, and it's actually not really data. That's what's called a start bit. Next come five to eight bits of data. It's configurable. Um, most of the time it's eight bits, but you can have less bits in your if you want to. Then comes a optional parity bit, and then a stop condition. Anybody know what parity means? 
But the parity bit is? Nope. Sorry? Error checking, yes. What error checking is it? Number of odd bits. But it's only one bit. Exactly. If the number of ones in your bit is odd, it's a zero. No, it's one. If it's even, it would be a zero. That's what the parity bit is all about. So it's only a little bit of an indication that, hey, if parity bit is wrong, your data is certainly wrong. You can't use it for correction, but it's for error detection itself. And it's also optional. So not everybody, not all UART protocols actually use a parity, and you have to know if the one that you're looking at has a parity bit or not. Yes? So, Mr. Lee, you pointed out how do you know if you start one bit or You just listen to the line. As long as it's high, nothing happens. As soon as it gets pulled down, <coughs> you know that a bit starts. And you're hinting to a very important problem there, right? And unfortunately, that comes like a couple of slides later, but how long, how do you know how long a bit is? Is it a certain Sorry? Is it a certain Yes. It has to be predefined. So both the systems have to know that we are talking 960 baud or bits per second, right? Or 115200 bits per second or 4 megabits per second. So both systems have to agree on a speed that they're talking about. Or else you would have a huge issue in detecting what is a bit and what is not a bit, right? Because what could happen is, if the first one is zero and all of these are zero, 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 then, well, you, you don't know where the boundaries are, right? You don't know when something stopped or what is a byte, what's a bit, and over multiple lengths, you don't know how to decode these particular <laughs> systems. At the end comes the stop bit. The stop bit is always logic one. And oftentimes, you can configure how many stop bits that you have, but you have to have at least one stop bit. After a stop bit, what could happen is that the next start bit comes immediately after that. But at least you have to have at least one stop bit to tell that, hey, our bit is now done, our byte is now done, the next thing comes on the line. Yes? If you don't know what fodder it is, there's a way to detect what fodder it is? If you're lucky, yes. If the other person always sends you all zeros, then you might have a difficulty of finding out the baud rate. But if you know that you have 8-bit parity and everything was all zero, you can kind of guess what the baud rate should be looking at a longer instance and longer times. So well, if they send you all zeros, they can just send you a set amount of bits. You can just figure out how many bits is in that amount of bits. Yeah, because you know that the data has to be up and up again right. at some point. So you can look what could be a byte length with the different configurations. You could find out the baud rate. The other one is also, most likely you will have a 0, 1, 0 transition somewhere in there. So you can look for the smallest up, down zero. that you can see to figure out the bit rate that you have. So yes, it does work. Some microcontrollers support automatic baud rate detection. So they use, they just look at the data lines to see what comes in and try to figure out what the baud rate is and then select and switch over to it. Yes? So do you have to agree on who's master who's zero? No. UART has two lines a receive and a transmit. The receive is, for me, the line that comes to me, and the transmit is the line that I'm sending out. So for you, my transmit will be hooked up to your receive, your transmit hooked up to my receive. So it's always full duplex in both ways. Any other questions? No? Okay. So from UART, we can go over to RS-232. Who has heard of RS-232 before? Pretty much everyone. That's your serial port on your computer. Well, today, you almost don't have no serial ports anymore, but back in the day, there was a serial port at the back, even on your laptops. RS-232 is very similar to UART, but instead of going 0, 1, or 0 to TTL levels, it goes from minus 12 to 12 volts. Why would you do that? Why not just only use UART? Longer distances, yes. Because now, you're you can reject noise a lot better because you have higher voltages, you can go longer distances cable-wise. But else it's very similar. Instead of being at a high all the time, the default is minus 12. That's when the line is idle. And then the start condition is at 12. And again, the stop bit would be just a low minus 12 volt. That's all. 
there is. Else, it works exactly the same way. There's a parity bit that you can set. And if you have ever used hyperterminal trying to talk to a modem or another serial device, that's always the things that they want to know is the baud rate, how many data bits you have, how many um, do you have parity, and how many stop <coughs> bits that you have in your data. So it's like something like 8N1 would be 8 data bits, no parity, one stop bit, which is the most typical configuration that you have in your serial codes. But there are other configurations that sometimes appear. Rarely, but they do appear. Yes? So 485 and 422 are both passive radiation modules. Yes, they are. And 485, it becomes differential. So you have two pairs that go in both directions. And then the, the signal is encoded differentially, so you can reject, reject noise even further, and you can go hundreds of meters with um, 485. But they're all kind of very, very similar in how they work. Very easy to translate into UART, so you can hook them up to your microcontroller, and then you just have like a transceiver chip that translates between the two systems. Okay, we talked about that one. How do peers agree on timing? Well, you have to agree on it. You have to set it ahead of time before you start communicating. Just a quick one, so for RS-232, the typical serial output looks like this, right? That was the thing that you had back then with the different pins that you have on here. And the thing that you have to remember is that if you have two devices, you somehow have to connect them from the receive to transmit and from transmit to receive. I don't, you probably these days don't do this anymore because we have Wi-Fi now, but when I started off with computers, we wanted to connect two computers to each other and then you had the serial cable that you just plugged into each computer. The problem is you have to have a special serial cable. It has to be a, what's called a null modem cable, which switches internally the receive to the transmit because if both have the exact same pin out, if you connect this pin to this pin, actually let's take the transmit data pin to the other person's transmit data pin, nothing will happen, right? So the transmit and the receive had to be flipped in the cable and connect it on the other side to inverse. That's what's called a null modem, modem cable, which is crossed. Any questions? So how do you find this in there? How do you find out that it's okay? Or cable testers. <laughs> yeah. You hook it up to a cable tester, and you push a button, and then it will tell you if the receive transmit is this way or that way, so like if it's flipping or not. As long as they're different on both sides, you'll find if usually if you have a, a male on one end and a female on the other one, it's just a straight through cable. It's just an extension cord. And that's also what this up here is, the DTE versus a DCE, where DTE stands for the data terminal equipment and DCE for data communication equipment, where the standard was slightly different, where one of them had to receive and to transmit inverted so that you could just use straight cables to go from one end to the other. Questions? Yes. For more signaling. So UART really only has a receive and a transmit. RS-232 has a data carrier detection. It has a data terminal ready. So just more indications to the other side telling you, hey, I'm really ready to receive something now or not. Yes? A lot of them are telephone. Yes. Old modems usually use them. Anything else these days, you don't use these pins anymore. Most of the times, it's really just three pins, ground, receive, and transmit that you use. No, it's just three pins, right? If I have ground, receive, and transmit, and you have ground, receive, and transmit, we can communicate, right? Make sense? Yeah? Yeah? Yes? So if I would give you a trace of a signal going up and down and up and down, could you decode it with this knowledge? Could you figure out what's going over the cable? Yes? Because yes. it's what you have to do in lab number six, I think, where I will, where, where you'll get a magic image that you'll put into the FPGA, and then you have to figure out what actually comes out on the pins and decode it. So it's kind of fun. All righty. Spy. Slightly more complicated in principle because it has, doesn't have just two buyers, but SPI stands for Serial Peripheral Interface and it has four or more connections. Three of them are the most important ones. That's the clock, a MOSI, a MISO, and a chip select line. 
So from this, you can already see that SPI is a synchronous protocol. You have a clock that gets distributed, which makes the implementation a lot simpler. Because now you have a clock signal, you know exactly what's happening. There is one problem though with SPI, and that it's not a standard. SPI is not standardized, so there are a lot of different variations on, different, on differences in SPI protocols. <clears throat> However, the advantages of SPI is that it's extremely fast, and it's widely used in a lot of different chips where fast speeds are necessary, but at the same time, you still don't need a high pin count, a high pin count to actually talk to a device. So how does it work? It's a four-wire communication bus. Um, it's typically used across very short distances. So for example, on a PCB to connect the radio to a, a microcontroller. It supports one single masters and multiple slaves. The synchronization is clocked. So the master outputs a clock to all the slaves so that they can actually decode and tell back a, data, a signal of what the slave wants to tell to the master. It's full duplex. What that means is that every time you write something onto the bus as a master, you will also receive something <laughs> from the slave. It's always bidirectional. There is no just a master sending only one thing and then the byte comes later on. So it's always full duplex. You can have multiple megabits per second. So clock rates can go from zero up to like 50 or 80 megahertz, which is not too uncommon. The transfer can have four to 16 bits. So you can have Usually you have eight bits, but sometimes you have more, and it supports multiple slaves. The wiring, four wires per slave that you have. MOSI, which is, stands for master out, slave in. MISO stands for master in, slave out, so which is the other way around. Then you have SCLK, or the slave clock, and SS or CS, so SS stands for slave select, sometimes also called CS as for chip select. The main idea is that a master node selects a slave and then starts communicating with it using the clock signal. What's the difference between this? Oh, okay, just spelled out on what the different signals are. So we have the MOSI, master out, slave in, MISO, master in, slave out, SS or CS, which is a unique line, so every chip has one chip select line. <coughs> SCLK, again, the clock line goes from a master to all the slaves, so they all share the exact same lines. The implementation of SPI can be extremely simple. In principle, all it is is two shift registers, one on the master, one on the slave, and then with the clock that goes from the master to the slave, what happens is there is a bit pushed out from the master going into the slave, and from the slave going into the master, you do that for, in this case, for example, eight clock ticks, and then they exchanged their two shift registers. Right? Very simple. You just clock eight times on your shift register. What was in here will now be in here. What's in here is now in here. And that's why there's, it's always full duplex. There's always data going out from the master. There's always data coming back from the mass layer. What can be tricky in doing this? There's one tricky thing with a, with a synchronous protocol. How do you set the master register to set clock registers? How do you set the master register? Oh, what happens is the la this bit goes in here, right? This bit goes in here. No, actually, it's getting, well, OK. You have to add one more bit over here in the shift register implementation. So what happens is it gets shifted over. So all of this content gets shifted one right. This gets shifted one right. And the last bit goes over into the zero position here, and this last bit goes into the zero position over here. Right? So data is never lost. It's just getting shifted into each registers. Is that the question? How do I, how do I tell the slave what data I want to send? How do I oh, you, you write it. Most of the time, a, a spy, yeah, OK. Most of the time, a spy is memory mapped. So what happens is this is a register somewhere in memory. As soon as you write into it, the spy transfer oftentimes happens, or you have to tell the spy transfer now, like with a control register or something like that. The bit gets pushed over, and then there will be a ready bit once the, the, the communication is done. That's how it goes. OK, lots of questions right now. Yes? How come you don't have two buffers set up in the registers on the master instead of 
most likely there in the actual implementation, yes, that's probably what happens. There will be shadow registers and all kinds of stuff. But in principle, it's just two shift registers. That's the most simple implementation you can do for it. Yes? So, <clears throat> me, depending on the systems that you have, if you're the master and you don't care what the slave, I think that gives you more. Yes. Or the other way around. If you sometimes just want to read from it, all you do is you pump data over zeros, for example, and you're only interested in what you get back. But the key is that there's always a byte that goes over and always a byte that comes back. Sometimes you have to ignore them or just send stuff over that's empty. But you have to write something in order to receive something from it, which will be significantly different from what we see in a second. Yes? So if you send over like eight zeros, mm -hmm. that's going to come back to you eventually. Right? If you really Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah, and then you just have another device connected to the state reading the information and you didn't have to like, read into the other side of the process. Okay, wait, what? I mean, if you just read the zeros, and yes. the slave would be taking other steps to bring on more to the slave. Yes, yeah. So oftentimes it then becomes really important what kind of slave device that you have. And I will do an example of what's actually happening, where we see something like this. Okay, so yes? So unlike you are, you don't even have to set all of them at the same bar rate. As long as slave can handle master's bar rate. There is a, almost, almost. So yes, certainly as long as it can handle the bar, or the speed of the clock, like as long as you're not going too fast, you can talk to each other. But there is one little detail. Yes? You have to worry about the propagation delay. Propagation delay? That's mostly, most of the time the problem that you can go too fast and your device cannot understand you anymore. So yes, but usually the data sheet of the device you want to talk to will tell you what the maximum speed is that it's rated at. And then you have to configure your clock to that rate. But there is another thing. Remember, this is not standardized. What types of clocks can you have in your system? Rising edge, falling edge. The clock can be active low, active high, or a passive low, passive high, right? As in New York, in New York, the definition was, well, if the bus is idle, the signal is high. Here, there is no standard. So in theory, there are four different ways of what the clock signal can be. And that's sometimes the tricky way of and the tricky thing you have to do and deal with in SPY. You have to go read the data sheet, understand what the clock has to be for this particular data sheet. And you then have to generate the right clock and push the data out the right way. Let, Couple of slides, I will explain this in more detail. Yes? So why is, it, why is there not a standard for it? Just to give it more flexibility? It just, there is no standard. Never has been standardized. I mean, they're, they're kind of pseudo standards, like these four different configurations, and there's not, nothing else, really. So people just adhere to them, and most of the time there is, there's like a spy zero mode, spy one mode, spy two mode, spy three mode, and most of the time people take spy zero mode, and they tell you, this is a spy zero mode, where clock polarity is this way, and the other one is that one, and then that's it, and you can talk to it. Yes? I know I2C. We will talk about I2C in a second. But the, the, the case with that, the reason why it's not a standard is because Phillips invented it 20 years ago and patented it, and nobody else had it. And then when they went out of patent, everybody else used it. So I, have, I bet this is similar. It's similar with respect to that? Uh, no, I, I think don't know. nobody wanted to have a patent on it, or nobody wanted, this, nobody wanted to patent this or have somebody else patent it so it's a bus system that everyone can, leave, can use. It's not like, no, you don't have to pay royalties or license fees or anything like that. So that was probably why it was just never really standardized. Okay, architectures. There are two main configurations that we can have. So on the left-hand side, this is the very typical architecture where you have one master node, multiple slaves. They all share the clock line. As you can see, the clock line is distributed to each and every one of them. Most line gets distributed, the MISO line gets distributed to everybody, and then you have a chip select line for each one of these nodes. There is another mode, and it exists. I have never seen it in reality, but here's a Maxim data sheet, which have one microcontroller where the MOSI gets connected to the slave, which has an input and an output, and then the data gets clocked through these particular chips. So it gets, goes from the in to its out, from its in to its out, Works similar, but there is actually no feedback that you get back from them. So it's just a one-way bus in this particular case. And again, it exists. I have never really seen it in reality, but sometimes you look at something and you're like, oh, wow, what is this? 
It could be just a very simple spy protocol. Yes? That second one looks like it's more than like one select line that uh, I'm guessing is for the chips that you send to each slave and check to see if that chip is like selected itself. The one on the left has three separate lines. Yes. Good question, data sheet. Yeah. Have to go and look at it and see what what is exactly does. Yes. I would have to go and read the data sheet myself. Yes. It probably is. So what probably happens is that every bit that comes in on the next clock edge, it goes out. And so you just select all of the chips and pump it through the whole system until it's at the end over here. And then everybody receives all of the data. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. There are four wires on the receive on the slave side. On the master side, you have three plus one for every slave, which is usually a chip select line. Yes, <laughs> I was just about to say that. In theory, some of the microcontrollers they actually have a special mode where all the chip select lines you can flick, uh, switch them into an encoder mode, so that you could have, for example, here a three to eight encoder on the outside. So you would have here a chip that takes these three as input and then generates, has um, eight output lines. So with just tri three chip select lines, you can control up to eight different slave devices that exists. Okay, so clocking of a spy. As I said, there is no real standard. And what you have to deal with is that there are two different phases, right? Like you can be sensitive on a rising edge or on a falling edge. In addition to that, there are two polarities where you can have inactive and passive low or passive high. So there are four different configurations of clocks. And you have to know what your slave device is understanding in order to generate it on the master appropriately. So once you have multiple slave devices, what happens is if they're all different and use different encodings, you basically first configure your clock for the slave A. You select slave A with a chip select line. Do a transfer, deselect slave A, and then if you want to talk to slave B, you have to reconfigure your clock system, select slave B, do the transfer, and then deselect B. So oftentimes, if you have multiple different no slaves with different kind of clock, um, clock requirements, you have to reconfigure your clock system before each and every transfer. This is how these three different clock polarities look like. We have clock polarity zero, phase zero, passive low, and the system wants the data on a rising edge. The other way around, which is the more common one, where we have the polarity zero, phase one, again, passive low, but the slave device now clocks this data in on the falling edge, right? This is very simple to deal with. On the master side, you clock it out on the rising edge, and your slave device will clock it in on the falling edge itself. So output on rising, reading on falling. Now you can have these both systems and just flip them around in polarity. Passive high, reading on the falling edge, or passive high, reading on the rising edge. So these are the four different clock modes that exist in spy devices. Yes? Can you explain that a little bit more? The passive low, passive high. Passive low, passive high means that if there is no chip select, the clock will be low. Or if there's no data happening, clock is low. By default. So that's what's here in the front. There's no transfer, clock is low. Right? In these two here, if there's no transfer or no clock signal happening, clock is high. Make sense? That's all there is. Um, it matters on the polarity then later on. So basically, the, the key is that for one of them, for the polarity, as you can see, if you are an active low, no passive low, 
and have a zero polarity means that the slave reads on the rising edge. You now have to output your data ahead of time, but there is not really a clock signal, so that can be slightly trickier to implement. That's why this mode is the most common mode, where most devices will have this particular mode. So you just de declare it as uh, clock phase one, polarity zero. You output at the rising edge, and the slave reads at the falling edge. And then you do it that way until the end, the transfer is over usually, after eight bits. But you can imagine that you can do it the other way around, where the clock is inverted, right? So the one down here, where now you output on the falling edge, and you read on the rising edge itself. That's the difference with the polarity. It can be a up or down. So you would read the polarity? Yes, <laughs> just inverted in polarity. Correct. Correct. Yes? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on the slave device that you talk to. Right? The slave device will have a protocol that it's spoken over the spy bus. And there it will define that it's four, seven, eight, sixteen bit transfers. Okay, let's do an example, because I think that's the most important thing to do with spies. Let's assume we have this particular chip, it's a VTI Technologies M2 axis accelerometer that has a spy interface. If you go to the data sheet, we see there are a couple of different commands that we can send to this chip. It gives us all different parameters that we need to have in order to talk to it. So for example, in this case, it says the digital output load at 500 kilohertz is one nanofarad, spy clock frequency, maximum 500 kilohertz. So that's the maximum speed we can talk to with this device. So what we can do is we can set our spy clock, configure it appropriately, and so that it generates 500 kilohertz signal. And now we have to talk to this device. So how does this work? Well. If you look at this diagram up here, we can see, okay, we have a clock, we have the chip select, right? The first thing we have to send is a command, and then comes a data in or a data out, and a data out. In this bit here, what will happen is that we just don't care what's written in there. The accelerometer will be on high Z, so what we clock in can be anything. Right? It's on high Z, we will sample it, but the word is the, the byte we will receive is just garbage. So the first byte we write over, we receive a byte for it, which is discarded. And then the next byte is either something that we write to it or something that we are interested in that it will read uh, it will write back to us and we can read. So what are the different commands? We can do a mess, which is a measurement mode, normal mode, operation mode after power on. So that's the mode the device will go into after power on. We can do a w, an RWTR, a read and write temperature data register, STX, activate self-test for X channel, activate self-test for Y channel, read X channel, read Y channel. So who can tell me what command is written up here? Yes? RWTR. Okay, how did you get there? Okay. So you can see that we have bit 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The command is set here. Zero, one, two, three. 0, 1, 2, 3. Rdax. Rdax, yes. Well, what do you think? Right? So it goes, rises up here. That's probably aligning with this one here, or just after the falling edge. It's probably reading here because here it's where static is, and back here is where it goes back down again. So it's bit number four. That gets set. Yeah. What? So the reading zero, one, oh. two, three. Yeah. So is that your command is the opposite of what your data would be? Data has also Good point. Yes. So he was right. <laughs> yes. This is bit number seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Right? 
And he's right, the, the hint comes from the data bit back here where you have bit seven first and six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. So this bit, the fourth octet is actually bit number three that gets written, which would make this a RWTR instruction. So if you now want to go, does this make sense? No, I'm sorry, are we sure? I am certain, <laughs> yes. Before I commit it to knowledge. <laughs> okay, sure. commit it into memory. <laughs> Yes. What are the different Big difference? The, the little commands in that Okay. Party. So for example, in this particular case, assume you want to read out the accelerometer's X channel, right? What do you do? Well, the first byte you send over would be a zero 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 one zero 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 zero, right? And then you write an all zeros over. And the data you will get back is the value of the X channel's acceleration, okay. right? So in that case, this would be the command, then data in, you just say zero, and the data that you will get back is the acceleration for the, of the X channel. If you were, would write this particular command over, you would get the acceleration of the Y channel. So this is a very simple spy interface. It starts to become a lot more complicated if you have, for example, a radio where instead of just having six commands, you pr probably have like 80 different commands. Okay, so the different commands will have different uh, descriptions. Of Absolutely. Okay. Protocols are very specific for a specific spy chip. Okay. And, ev and every spy device has usually its own protocol on what the different commands mean or anything else. So it's, it's really, you have to go and look at the data sheet to understand. And then basically based on the data sheet, you write a driver that can talk to a specific spy interface. Okay. Yes? So what's the read and write time of the data register? Is that... I don't know. How do you read it? Do you just push some bits in and then it'll go? We would have to go and look at the data sheet itself. I'm, when I write this, I'm like, it doesn't really make sense to write a temperature register. Actually, it looks like it's sending what it has back at the same time So like the next, the very next byte is your desired value that you want to store, and then the data comes back out. But read and write, I get, I would think that it would be all in one transaction. But how would you? Why would you write a temperature register? That doesn't make any sense. It could be for cal for calibration or something. But then there must be a certain data you can write in there that will be discarded, because else you you will never know the right temperature. So you always will overwrite what was in there before. So I'm not entirely sure what the reading by temperature data register means. Yes? So any activity you need to uh, before any command you need to uh, send a written command? No. So in this, in this case, there might be different modes that you can put this device into. Maybe there's a temperature measurement mode. <laughs> or in this case, there is a measurement mode. So in this case, when you turn on the device, it's automatically in measurement mode. But maybe you could put it into a test mode with a certain command. And then to get back into measurement mode, you have to send it this command. So then you say, then you want to do Yes, right. most likely. That's how this device works. I don't know why VTI decided on doing that, but they probably had a very good reason um, for designing the device like that. But so in this case, if you have a spy device or a spy sensor that you want to interface with, it's extremely important to actually read the data sheet of this device because the data sheet will tell you what bits and bytes you have to send to the device to configure it right in order for it to do the purpose you want to do with it. Okay, so a couple of pros of spy. I mean, it's extremely fast point-to-point -point protocol. So as you said, you saw you can go up to like 50 megahertz. That's fast for a serial protocol especially on your small little um, distances that you have. It easily allows streaming of data. As you can see, like every time I send something over, I get something back. So you can be very fast in getting data from a device. It has no addressing. The addressing is done using its own chip select line. Are you looking for a calculator? Okay. Um, it's very fast um, and it's broadly supported. There are a lot of different sensors out there that are, have spy interfaces. 
there's memory out there that spy interfaces, there are LCDs with spy interfaces. Almost all radios I know of have a spy interface mode to actually talk to them. So it goes very quick. Um, <laughs> cons are you do need a slave select line. So if you have a lot of devices, it can become cumbersome to actually do and deal with it. There is no acknowledgement. You never really know did the device actually understand me and did it receive the bytes that I sent over. There is no arbitration. As you saw, like the multiple lines are shared between the slaves. It could happen that two or three slaves by mistake ride into the same lane, uh, line and that's a problem. You have two devices that are fighting now each other. And there is no flow control. So you have to make sure that the slave can really keep up with what you're doing with it. Or else there's no acknowledgement. It, doesn't never, it will never tell you that, hey, you're overloading me. It will just come garbage out of your system and then you have a problem and you have to deal with it somehow in software. Couple of peripherals, as I mentioned, LCDs, lots of sensors out there that have spy interfaces, radios, and many, many more. So accelerometers, gyroscopes, other IMU sensors. Sometimes you actually hook up two different microcontrollers over spy. You have one microcontroller in spy slave mode, the other one in spy master mode. Now you have a very fast protocol between the two to talk to each other. Okay, I square C. So we saw spy, a nice synchronous protocol, fairly easy. In principle, just two shift registers. Now we will talk about one that's a lot more complicated. As Enid just told before, um, I square C, pronounced I square C, um, sometimes called I two C, but less often it's really most of the time I square C. It's a two wire serial bus, and it was invented in, 19, in the 1980s by Philips, now part of NXP. It was patented protocol, so you could not just use it. And with that came a lot of restrictions on who actually used um, I2C. The patent by now has been expired, but it's still licensed, so, or trademarked actually. So you can still not just use I2C in your data sheet and on your chips. That's why oftentimes, instead of naming it I2C, they call it two-wire interface. It's the exact same thing, but they avoid the trademark. <laughs> so in, originally, I2C was used by Philips in television sets. Um, now, extremely common for sensors because it's a really convenient protocol. It only has two wires, and you can hook up up to 127 um, different devices on it. The intended use um, is for embedded systems, so Philips, National, Xyrock, uh, Cycor, Siemens, and all many different manufacturers use it. And it's actually also used in your PCs. If you have ever heard of the SM bus, that's basically a deriv derivative of the I2C bus. Many of the sensors in your, on your motherboards are hooked up to the SM bus, and that's an I2C bus system. So it works very similar to the I2C bus system. The architecture is completely different from what we have seen before. There's just two wires that go from every device to every other device. And the two wires are a clock line and a data line called SDA or SCL or SCK. So SCK for ser uh, slave, uh, serial clock or SCL, like it's just a slightly different nomenclature. But it's SDA and SCL. So, What's the problem with this? We have two wires. One is a clock line, the other one is a data line. And you have a whole bunch of different devices that are hooked up to these two wires. Yes. Right? The question is who is talking on the bus? So you have to have some sort of bus arbitration, making sure that not everybody starts talking at the same time on the bus, or else you have fighting devices trying to drive the bus. And Philips had a really neat idea on how to deal with that. What they said is that, well, everybody on the bus can only pull the line low. Nobody's driving the bus high. Driving the bus high works by two pull-up resistors that will always pull the line high. So as soon as everybody lets go of the line and nobody's driving the bus, the line will go high automatically because of the pull-up resistor. As soon as somebody is driving the bus, it bus gets pulled low, and other people know somebody's actually driving the bus. So there's no fighting on the bus because everybody can only pull the line low. If two people pull the line low, no problem, right? I mean, sure, there's still maybe a conflict that both of them want to use the bus, and there's an arbitration on how to deal with that that I will show you in a second. 
But there will never be two people, one trying to pull the line down, another one pulling, trying to pull the line up, because the pull up is done by two re uh, resistors that are sitting up there. Okay, so we have a line, the pull up resistor. What could be the problem with this? So if you have a line on a PCB, right, and a resistor that tries to pull it up, assume somebody pulled that line down, and I now let go of that line. What happens with that line? Like if you look at, look at this line in an oscilloscope, will this look like this? <clears throat> no? What will happen? What, what is inherent to this? We have a resistor and we have a line. There will be some ringing, but basically it's an RC network, right? The line is a C, there's a certain kind of capacitance on that line, and you have a resistor trying to pull this line up to high. So it's basically charging that line. So what will happen is that this line will look something like this. This is, oftentimes it goes sharper than this, but if you look at it and zoom in on your scopes, you will see the line going up like this. What will define how fast this line goes up there? The resistor value. So the bigger the resistor value, the slower, right? And the size of your traces. Sorry? And the size of your traces. And the size of your traces will define the capacitance that you have on your traces, yes. Right? But once you have your lines, the only thing you can change is the resistors. And what you want to have is a slow enough yeah. resistor that these lines get pulled up as fast as they can. But you don't want to be too small, because the smaller they are, as soon as you start pulling that line low, there will be more current flowing through that resistor. So most of the time you are in the couple of tens of Ks, like 10K, 5K, to 100K, depending on how fast you want to go. Because depending on how fast this line rises, that will actually define the maximum speed you can run your system at. Because you always have to let go of the line for the line to go up, and then you pull it back down again for the next clock edge. It goes over, and then you let go of the line. So the faster this line goes up, the faster you can actually schedule these clock ticks themselves. And that's actually one of the limitations of I square C. So speeds can go up to 3.4 megabits per second in the standard, which is extremely fast. Most of the time, they will go to 400 kilohertz. That's kind of what most I2C devices will support. But there are some I2C devices that go up to higher speeds. The other thing is you can have multi-masters. So there's not just one master. On the bus, there can be multiple masters, and you can have multiple slaves. And the protocol just becomes a lot more complication, complicated, because now you have to have bus arbitration, which we'll cover in a second. All right. Any questions so far? With I square C. Yes? An open collector buffer. Good question. Very good question. It's not easy. But basically, it's an open collector buffer where if you give it a 1, it will put the output on high Z and not do anything. And if you put it a 0, it will pull it to 0. That's all there is really to it. Yes? We will, we will get there. So why would you want to use IP0 over SPI, if SPI can go faster, if you have multiple uh, masters? Um, not just that, it's only two wires. Okay, so right? SPI is only, it's only one Yeah, but assume you have 100 devices you want oh, to hook okay. up, right? Okay. Now all of a sudden you have 100 pins, or you have to have multiplexers in between that help Lots of wires that go everywhere. Okay. With I square C, it's really just two wires that you hook everything up to. It makes it a lot easier. How many devices do you have to see? I square C? We will look into it oh. when we when we see the others. It's 127, and there's a reason for that. Actually, there can be more, but it's usually 127. Okay. Actually, we covered all of this already. So the clocking is not a traditional clocking. It's always a pull down, let go, pull down, let go. But in addition to that, a master or a slave usually puts out its clock, and if the receiving end cannot keep up with it, 
it just keeps the line low. So the master knows that, oh, the slave is not ready yet and has to wait until the slave actually can let go of the line too. There's a nice way of how you can do flow control now, right? So the master is pulling the line low, let go, pull low, let go, and when you pull lows and let go, and after that the line stays low, well, it has to wait until the line reaches high again because the slave wasn't ready yet to receive the next bit. So it's a really neat way of dealing with this. I2C transactions work as follows. There is a transmitter, receiver, which differs from the master slave from before. So an I2C is somebody that transmits and somebody that receives. Or uh, somebody, yeah, yes. And they can flip direction in between the transaction itself. So what happens is that the transmitter sets the data on the data line and the slave acknowledges it. So in this case, it would actually be the receiver acknowledges it. That way, the transmitter knows that the receiver received its part. So for a read on your bus, the slave is the transmitter. So if, if I want to read from something, the other guy is transmitting to me. If I'm writing, okay, this is all completely wrong. Let me start over again. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so there is a transmitter and a receiver, and there is a master and a slave. Okay? So the master on the bus initiates a transaction. And the slave is the target of this particular transaction. But because we only have two wires and one shared data bus, sometimes the transmitter and the receiver switch roles between the master and the slave. So initially, the master will initiate a transaction, write something to the bus, and the slave will receive. Depending on if it's a read or a write, the slave will then transmit on the bus and the master will receive if it's a read from a slave. If it's a write to the slave, then the master will keep transmitting on the bus and the slave will keep receiving the data. Did that make sense? Yes? Because it's a shared bus, you have to transmit and receive the shares and switches sometimes. Okay. Initially, to start a transaction, since the bus is always high because of the pull-up resistors and everybody has an open collector, there is a start condition. The start condition is when the data line gets pulled low, but the clock is still high. That's what's called a start condition. After the start condition comes seven bits of address and one more bit indicating if it's a read or a write, and then one more bit of acknowledgement. How does it work? The master puts out seven bit of an address. The slave who has that address will hear that, start knowing, okay, this transaction is for me. It will look at the next bit, which will decide if this is a read or a write transaction. So it will either receive more data from the master or it will start driving and pu pushing the, the bus. And then the acknowledgement would be a bit where the slave pulls down the line telling the master that, hey, I received your data, we can keep going. If the acknowledgement doesn't happen, the master knows that this particular address either doesn't exist on the bus or wasn't ready to talk to me and it has to try it again on a later point. The data transmission is very similar as before. It's eight bits with a ninth bit of an acknowledgement. So what happens is it goes from most significant bit down to least significant bit and then one bit of acknowledgement, which the receiver will always pull down. So for example, if it was a read from a slave device, right? now the master has to pull down the acknowledgement, telling the, the slave device that, hey, I received this byte. Make sense? OK. At the end of the transaction, what happens is that The master pulls the, S, the, the clock line high while the data is still low. And this particular condition will tell us that this is either an abort of the transaction or it's the end of the transaction, how it happened correctly. So there's a start condition, address, read, write, acknowledge, data, acknowledge, stop condition. Yes? Master wants to send, send any information. At first, it's used to one. If it's 
let's go through it again. Because there's, I have it now nice visually, right? So what we have is SDA is high, SDL is high. Remember, it's an open collector system. They're always driven high due to the fact of the pull-up resistors. A master pulls down the data line while the slave line is still high. That's basically a sign to everybody else that, hey, something is coming on the bus. You should better start listening. Next comes 7 bit of address. The 8 bit will be a read or a write, so it's either a high or a low, telling the slave that I want to read from it or I want to write to it. What this bit indicates is that the next byte over here is either driven by the master or it's driven by the slave. Right? Then comes the acknowledgement, which will be pulled low if the slave actually received my request. And then in the next transaction comes the data, again with a ninth bit of acknowledgement. And then at the very end comes the stop condition. Yes? So what happens if the, the slave successfully <coughs> Um, it probably depends on the chip. There might be some chips that repeat, others abort. Does the master always need to block the I think it does, yes. Why didn't you say? Oh, because that would be, it's expected. I'm on this clock oh, it's assigned to the to the slave that yeah. it should output data now. Because yes. I want to say there there when there's a receive, the the master does some kind of clock something. I can't remember what it is on the slave receive. Slave, you mean when a slave is driving the data? Well, what can happen is that the slave, if it's not ready yet, it keeps the, the clock low. Yeah. So in that case, yes, the master is always pushing the, the clock in the line. And the slave can keep it low to slow you, the master down if it's not fast enough. Great. Yes? So he said uh, it's 10 to 4 up to 125 times faster than the person doing the, the addresses. Yes. You said you can hack away to have more of the development. There are more addresses on that. I believe, <laughs> don't, I have to read the exact standard that Phillips had, but I think. Philips had a standard that was supported 127 bits, so or 127. Down. There is now an extended address mode okay. in I2C that some chips support. So for example, Texas Instruments um, I2C peripheral supports an extended addressing mode where it can go up to 10 bits okay. per device. And then you get, oops, then you get 10 bits here in the front, plus a read-write, plus oh, an nice. ability. That would be a lot of devices, yes. Yes? It's just, um, yes, because you have the read-write bit that you have to have in the first command, right? You could, but back in the day when you had a lot of 8-bit microcontrollers, like 1980s, you didn't want to have, like, everything have to have 16 bits of recognition and stuff like that. So it was just easier to keep it at 8 bits for 7-bit address, 1-bit read-write was their decision. But yeah, that's why today we have, there is this extended mode that you can have up to 10 bits of that um, addressing. Which at 120, yeah, 1,024 devices, the bus becomes pretty busy. Like the data rate is of course going down. Yes? Oh. Accelerometers, real-time clocks, um, what else is there? some flash, LCDs sometimes have, so for example, the LCD that you have on the um, Smart Fusion that OLED displays an I2C device is hooked up as I2C. So, so in our upstream projects, anything that you want to do Sometimes, yeah. Temperature sensors, many digital temperature sensors use I2C because basically everything that and everything that doesn't need a super high data rate, right? Like a temperature sample, you usually don't want it more than once per second or even slower. So I2C is perfect for that kind of device. Yes? Similar. 
I squared S is the inter interchip sound device. Very similar to the protocol, but it's different. I should know because I implemented my I2S device. Um, but <laughs> it, um, I2S usually only goes one way. I remember that one. Because you usually have like somebody that wants to send the sound to somebody else and not bidirectional. It is for sound, yes. Yes. The addressing? Oh, uh, the arbiter. Okay, good one. I actually forgot about that. Um, since you can have multiple masters, how it works is if two masters try to catch the bus at the same time, well, the first one is, you know if a transaction is going on, you have to leave the bus alone until you still a stop condition. But assume two masters, by chance, send out the start condition at the exact same time. The rule is that the person that talks to the lower ID gets the bus. Remember what happens. You, they put both out an address over here, right? At some point, one of the two probably wants to let go of the address line to get write a one in it, which would be a higher address, and the other one just keeps it low. As soon as he sees that somebody else is actually driving the data line, that master has to let go and give the bus to the other guy. <coughs> Correct. Now, interesting parts happen, and I actually don't know what specified if both of them want to talk to the exact same address. That will be interesting. I'm not entirely sure what would happen. But usually the person that lets go of, or wants to let go of a line and sees that the line doesn't go back up, it, he backs off. Yes? Yes. Lower addresses will have higher priority. But only if you have a multi-master system. And multi-master I2C systems are not that common. It, they do exist, but it's not very common. Yes. What you have to do is, so that's the nice part about it being a standard. Because Philips assigns you an address. So when you basically, that was part of the licensing agreement and the, the royalty fees that you pay to Philips, they assign, for example, Texas Instrument a certain address at the top. And then Texas Instrument had a couple of bits at the back that they could use for different devices. Right? And then oftentimes, since sometimes you want to have more than one temperature sensor, that's the exact same temperature sensor, so they, are come to, they don't come with a completely pre-programmed ID, but they have a couple of I.O. lines that you can pull up or, low, up or down to define the last two bits, for example, of the address. So that you can have the exact same chip, but change its address in the last two bits. So yes, you, you, you as a designer of your hardware have to make sure that there are not two devices with the exact same address sitting on the bus. Yep. There's not that many, yes. But it, it usually works out, like because oftentimes you don't need five or six different accelerometers on your device. So and then you just take two different manufacturers and they have different addresses at the top and off we go. It doesn't happen that often that you have full conflict. So that's a nice place. Yes. <laughs> or unless you want to use two to the five companies on your board with different I2C devices, right? Then so companies can have different devices? Yes, they could. I mean, yeah, because there are more than that many companies out there making a lot of different devices, so. Okay, let's do USB next time because it's a fairly complicated um, bus system. Okay, that would be it.